I think that's all I have for announcements for our call to worship. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. And this is Jesus speaking. It says, Come to me, all of you who are tired from the heavy, heavy burden you have been forced to carry. I will give you rest. Accept my teaching. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will be able to get some rest. Yes, the teaching that I ask you to accept is easy. The load I give you to carry is light. Let's all worship this morning. Morning. First song this morning will be page 596. I'd like you all to I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life of Calvary To save the rest like me I heard about his broken And his precious blood of me Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Sing. 
next song is 599. After this, we'll ask for the Jerry Lord to lead us in prayer and a very passion of our scripture reading. Oh, how sweet will be to meet the Lord when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be our Lord when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet will be.
Scripture reading today is taken from Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was, on, was upon, the face of, and the, upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God said, And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. This is my Father's world. I invite you all to stand. This is my Father's world. And to my morning uh, and we do have a lot of people out uh, and I got to notice in our board uh, over here uh, 94 last Sunday uh, 61 today uh, two weeks ago it was 58 uh, and Ryan showed me some of the figures uh, that we've had and we've had over 100 several times this year it reminds me of uh, what I saw in the stock, the stock market this week. Did y'all notice that? Up and down, up and down, up and down. You never, every morning you wake up, you don't know what to expect and everything. If you watch the stock market, not that uh, uh, it does me a lot of good to watch it, but we're sure glad that you're here this morning. Glad to see Carolyn and Jerry uh, out this morning. Not that they feel the best, that's not the point, but they are here this morning and. Uh, we're glad that they are. We've got a lot of other people that are out and gone. I don't even know where everybody is. I know where some of them is. Some of them's in Texas. Much, much over here is out and gone. And there may be somebody that is afraid of the coronavirus. 
and uh, they're taking that to heart, and that may be why they're not here. Uh, could be. Uh, I'm not, uh, I guess I've got two minds on coronavirus. One thing that I want to announce to you this morning, uh, it's been my habit for the last 30 some odd years to stand at the door as you go out and shake hands with you. Uh, and I try to shake hands with everybody uh, just simply to let you know that I'm glad that you're here. And speaking on God's behalf, uh, that uh, He's happy that you're here. Uh, but with uh, everything that's been going on, I know that there will be some or some that are reluctant to shake hands. Uh, and they say, uh, you know, there's the fist bump. Uh, I never did do that before. I guess I could start. But they say don't do that either. They say don't do that. And then they got what they call the elbow bump. Uh, Jerry, I can remember a time when that would have been considered rude to elbow somebody. So I ain't going to get into that part either. <clears throat> what I'm going to do to you this morning, and uh, I suppose maybe... Uh, might do it for two or three Sundays. I don't know how long this is going to last, but I'm just going to nod this morning when you come out and keep my hands in the pocket, my pockets. And then that way, uh, if there's anybody that's reluctant to shake hands, but uh, you go ahead and shake hands with me anyway because you think you ought to, but you don't really want to, uh, that way it won't be on you. It'll be on me. So I'm just going to tell you this morning when you come out, don't shake hands. I've done already done a few. <laughs> Jerry done contaminated you this morning. <laughs> uh, I, it, because it's a habit, you know. You, you, you're in the habit of doing that. But um, Beverly and I was talking um, about this. Uh, she, know, she knew about my decision to do this. Uh, and, of course, I talked to the elders about it. And um, they approved uh, but a lot of times, especially if we have our normal crowd, uh, if I shake hands with 100 people or close to 100, uh, probably 50 of y'all uh, I'll shake hands with when you first come in. So by the time I leave here, I've done shook hands 150 times. So uh, one of the first things that I do when I get home on Sunday morning uh, after church is, is I go in there and wash my hands real good. I do that anyway, and it was long before this coronavirus or whatever it is showed up. So, But anyway, I'm going to save you the problem of doing that. That's what we're going to do, at least uh, for right now. And then we'll see how this thing goes. One of the problems that has come up so far as I'm concerned, I noticed it this morning. I turned the news on, uh, on TV this morning, and um, uh, if you did... Uh, I don't know what uh, channel you had it on, but I can just about guarantee, I just about guarantee you every channel, that's all it's on is coronavirus. You'd think that there's nothing else going on in the whole world, just just this virus, that's all there is. Uh, and I guess I'm kind of, uh, I, I don't like to say I've got a one-track mind, I would think that there'd be something else. Surely there's something else that they could report, but uh, one of the things that I was disappointed in, uh, if you watch TV, um, the only people that's got in the whole world that's got any control over the coronavirus is politicians and doctors. You notice that? Nobody else is in the news. Nobody else can do anything about nothing. It's doctors and politicians, and that's all there is. And I kept watching, and I kept watching, and one of the things that I thought was sadly missing is nobody said anything about God. Uh, maybe you saw something and I missed it, but nobody said anything about prayer. As a matter of fact, the only thing that I've heard is, is from the opposite direction, you ought to go to church. Uh, somebody, a guy was at you this morning that said that they recommended that if your church was over 200 people, uh, uh, don't go to church. I don't know why 200 is a cutoff. If you got 199, uh, go. But if you got 201, don't go. That don't make a lot of sense. But that's what they say. Uh, and I noticed a couple of days ago that our governor here in the state of Kentucky, he just recommended that we just everybody just call it off. Don't have no more church. 
Um, and I don't know how long that, anybody know how long that he recommended that we do that for? I never did hear. Uh, what I've heard was that they're not going to have a, a real total control of this thing for another year and a half. Did anybody hear that? Another year and a half. Uh, should we get up here, elders? Uh, and announce to the congregation, hey, Mount Zion, don't come back till September of 2021. Um, no, we're not going to do that at Mount Zion. As a matter of fact, what I'd recommend to our governor, and this is not political, uh, I'm going to say, you run Frankfurt and we'll run Mount Zion. We, we'll make a decision here at Mount Zion. Uh, and that's not to say we would never close church at Mount Zion. That's not to say that by any means. We'll wait. We'll see how things go. Uh, if uh, it goes in a direction where we do need, for some reason, to close the services, we'll do that. Uh, but it'll be a, it'll be the decision of the church here at Mount Zion, not the governor or the president or anybody else. They don't run that. Um, and you'll notice that um, I'm going to give God credit for that because you'll notice that we got on the board up here. This is my father's world. God made it. And God owns it and God runs it. Uh, we don't think that in this society. What, what is it about it we think? Uh, well, God may have made it, uh, but, he, uh, but we own it and we run it. And everybody wants to run God's business for him. What is it about us today that we don't want God in charge of anything anymore? I don't understand this. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of little little things here this morning as we get into the lesson. One is, um, how many, my daddy's been dead now for about 25 years, 20, 24 years. <coughs> how many of you in the audience remember my daddy married in the seedings? Uh, I'm going to say about half of you. About half of you. Well, if you knew him, you knew he was a preacher, you knew he was a farmer, knew he was an elder here at Mount Zion, preached here many times. Uh, but there may be one thing that you didn't know about him, and that is that Daddy could juggle. Anybody know that about my Daddy? He could juggle. Uh, I can too. And there's a the proof right there. I can really do that. I can just do one, I'll be honest with you. Whether it be a big ball or a little ball, I can't do but one. Daddy can do five. Keep them in there and do five. I marvel anybody's got that much coordination, but he could joke. Uh, and he would do that to entertain us at home, our kids, the, our, my brothers and sisters. Uh, and he would juggle apples. Uh, I've seen him sit at the breakfast table and juggle biscuits. And, you know, the flower would fly. Not the fur, the flower would fly. <laughs> uh, and I've seen him do, uh, you know, orange. And, uh, and he would keep them going. And I, I think he liked to do that. But he could juggle. Uh, he said he could do eggs. But my mom never would let him do that in the house. And uh, maybe he could have. Uh, but that's nothing. He had a talent that I sure didn't have. But think how much greater that God does than man. And yet we don't even give God credit. Uh, here's God. Uh, and we're saying this morning, this is my Father's world. Uh, and uh, uh, this is His world. He made it. Uh, you heard what Barry read to us this morning. In the beginning, God created God made it. Uh, and if we go over into the Psalms, we'll find out there that it's not the God that just made it. He owns it. It's His. Man gets the idea that it's ours, but it's not. It's God's. And we go back to Genesis chapter 8, and we find out He runs it. Man likes to think He runs it, but He doesn't. Now, I want you to think for a minute. You know, I was talking about Daddy being able to keep five in there at one time. Uh, you think about what God's doing. Here's the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and when God created it, these are little things. We call them little things or big because we got no, we got no way even understanding. Wednesday night we learned that David said, 
that some of the things about God uh, was was too wonderful for him to understand. Too wonderful. Uh, which really, really means that they were above his pay grade. They were above his pay grade to understand. Uh, and here's one of them right here. We think we got all this down pat and we don't know nothing. God created it. God made it. Uh, God owns it and God runs it. And here's the earth that he made. And Job said, here's what Job said. Job said that when he made it, he hung it on nothing. It took us a long time to figure out that God hung it on nothing. For years, in different cultures, somebody said, uh, what's the earth sitting on anyway? And they said, it's sitting on Atlas's back. I'd love to see Atlas when you... It sat on Atlas. And there was one culture that said that it sat on a giant tortoise. A tortoise. It had to sit on something. But Job said it didn't. That God made it and he hung it on nothing. And here it is even today. Uh, and the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Can you believe that? A thousand miles an hour. It were the other night we got a little old wind gust that was 60 miles an hour and it bothered us a little bit. Blowed over my grill and done a bunch of damage around there. And if that, but it runs at a thousand miles an hour day and night and we don't even know it. We don't even feel the wind all the road. How does God do that? And we know, the reason we know it's doing a thousand miles an hour, 25,000 miles around, takes 24 hours to do it to make a day. There you are, there's your figures. But more than that, not only is it spinning as it goes through space, but it makes an orbit around the sun, and it's 595 million miles for that one orbit. It takes a year, 365 days to go out there and come back. And I thought, wow, well, how fast? Now, not only is it doing 1,000 miles an hour here, but it's going 666,600 miles an hour through space. And we don't feel that either. God, how do you do that? Well, here's how I do it. I made it, I own it, and I run it. Uh, and it's too wonderful for you to understand. It's above your pay grade. And yet, here I am trying to run the world. Speaking of me as man... Let me tell you a couple of things this morning that will help you understand, I believe. What happens when man says, uh, uh, here God, let me run that for you. And that's happened a number of times. Man has said, I'm going to run it. But every time that man's in charge, here's what happens. And you can go back through Bible history and you can see it through history in your own lifetime. Every time that man tries to run God's business for him, there's disruption. What have we got today? Disruption, we can't even get toilet paper to take home. Disruption, we got disruption. And we got disaster, we got disease, we got destruction, and we got death. Every time that man says, God, I'll run this for you, this is what's going on. This, every time we leave God out of it, we don't consult God, we don't pray to God, we don't give him the credit, this is the result. This is the net result of what happens every time this happens. And we've seen that time and time again. Let me tell you, tell you a few incidents in the Old Testament that will help us to remember it a little bit better. There was a fellow whose name was Nimrod. Uh, and Nimrod considered himself to be somebody. Now, the Bible says about him that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And that means more than just going out here hunting rabbits. That that before the Lord uh, means an awful lot. Before the Lord. Uh, and here's what, he, here's what he put together. Uh, I think it had a lot to do with the flood. When the flood came... Uh, they got together and he said, let us make a name for ourselves." Where's the humility? Tonight I'm supposed to speak on humility and we may just cheat a little bit and put that one in there. Let us make a name for ourselves. 
You know what people are wanting today? What's politicians about? They want to make a name for themselves. That's what it's about. And so Nimrod did that, and he got a bunch of people together, and they went to the plain of Shinar, and they built a tower. The tower was called the Tower of Babel, and they started making, and they're going to build this all the way to heaven. I forget how far that is. Um, I wonder if they're going to follow the same path that God's earth is going in. Never mind that. But nevertheless, we're going to build a tower to heaven. Uh, and God looks down from heaven, and he sees what they're doing, and it must remind him of ain't hell. It must regard uh, uh, what these people are doing of God as an anthill. Uh, and I can relate to that. Have you ever done this or you ever watched the ants and they're crawling around? Some's coming, some's going, some's carrying, some of them's going back to the hole and everything. And you watch and you're kind of fascinated for a few minutes and then you get tired of it and you go like that. And that's the end. Of it. That's what God did at the Tower of Babel, Brian. He said, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this attitude. They want to run it. Uh, and all God did was, He just confused their language. And one of them spoke, it never had been spoke before, but God invented a bunch of new languages right there on the spot. Uh, and somebody said, Hand me the saw. And He said, What? And the other said, Hand me a hammer over here. And He said, What? They didn't even know what they were talking about. And so, Ultimately, what happened was they couldn't run it. And they all dis dissipated in different directions. Every time that man tries to run it, you're going to find disruption. And you're going to find disaster. And ultimately, you'll find death. And that was the death of that tower. Today, you go over there in the plain of Shinar. We know pretty close to where it was. Uh, in the country, present day Iraq. And you can't find one brick of that original tower. You can't even find where they built it. God just completely obliterated it. And then I think about a man that we know as Pharaoh when he was in Egypt. Uh, and he thought that he was the top dog of everything. Now, we called him Pharaoh. Uh, and God's people were there. And God told Moses, he said, go down and see Pharaoh and tell him let my people go. And so Moses goes down to Egypt and he tells Pharaoh, God said, let his people go. And Pharaoh said, I run this. I own it. I run it. I made this empire. Uh, we'll do what I say. And Moses said, Pharaoh, you're making a mistake. God ain't going to like this. If I go back and tell God you ain't going to do it, you ain't going to like it because there's going to be some bad results. Uh, but he wouldn't do it. He ran it. He owned it and so forth. Uh, and so God started sending plagues. I wonder if there's anything like the coronavirus. But they had the plagues, locusts, flies, frogs, uh, on and on and on until finally death. See, that's what happens. Death is always the final thing. Death, death of the firstborn in every family if they did not comply. And boy, they were thousands of people that died simply because somebody, uh, as my daddy used to say, wanted to be the big Ike. I run it, I own it, this is mine. And we know that it disastrous results. But I wonder if you've heard about this. Well, there's a man whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and he was the emperor of Babylon. And because... Israel had wanted to run their own business without God in it. They uh, had been carried off into captivity. Um, and here's what Pharaoh said, or not Pharaoh, but Nebuchadnezzar said him about himself. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this one to you because uh, I want to make sure I get it right. He said, um, I, this is what he said in Daniel chapter 4, I, have built this great Babylon. Who built it? I did. I have built this great Babylon by my might and by my power and for the honor of my majesty. What's that sound like to you? I made it, I own it, and I run it. And Daniel said, that's a mistake, Nebuchadnezzar. You're only there because God allows you to be there. 
Uh, but he wouldn't have it any other day, any other way. Uh, and you know what happened next after he said this? He said, I built this great Babylon for my power, my honor, and my majesty. You know what the next one? The next place that we see Nebuchadnezzar is he's down on his hands and knees and grazing with the cows. Now you've got to be humble to get down on your hands and knees. And so God humbled him. And he taught him and he showed him. And the Bible says, King James Version says, until seven times. That just simply means seven years. Boy, that's a lot of learning, isn't it? Seven years long. Uh, and he learned that God made it. And that God owns it. And that God runs it, not him. And when he come out from the seven years, he had a whole different outlook on life. He said, it wasn't me after all. It was God. And I'm telling you this morning that every time that man does this, it's disruption, disaster, disease, destruction, and death. That's the result of it. In Luke chapter 12, coming to the New Testament, Luke chapter 12, we find a man there, we call him the rich farmer, don't know his name. Uh, but he had this attitude, uh, I made it, I own it, and I run it. That's what the rich man said. He said, I've had good crops. I'm going to tear my barns down. I'm going to build bigger barns. Uh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And you know what God said to him? He didn't send this by a message by somebody else. God said to uh, this to him. He said, you fool. And it's not very often that those words, Jesus warns us about using that term. Jesus said, be careful about calling somebody a fool. But that's what God called him. He said, you fool. He said, this night thy soul is required of thee. Now who shall these things be? You own it. You, uh, you made it. You own it. You run it. Is that right? Well, if you did, you don't. And he was dead that very night. Now let's bring it down to modern day. We'll finish the lesson this morning. <clears throat> when man takes charge of God's world and he wants to run it, look what happens. Well, I tell you what happens. Disruption, disaster, disease, destruction, and ultimately death. We've got a mindset in this country today on abortion. And here's what man says. I'll run this. A woman has got a right to do anything with her body that she wants to. That's a right. I'll run it. Uh, and our question is, and God's question is, what about the right of that baby? Are you choosing, are you taking your right and its right both? No answer. Uh, we find um, homosexuality, what two consenting adults do behind closed doors. We got an answer for that. Don't ask and don't tell. Every time that we get into a situation like that, we made it, we own it, and we run it. It's not what God said. Listen to this one right here. And this is so rampant in our society today. It's called by our society premarital sex. Premarital sex. Uh, Bible calls it fornication. But boy, that's such a nasty word and it doesn't come off the tongue. And, and nobody wants to say fornication because that's such a bad word. Call it premarital sex. That's a sin, God says. And man, if you're trying to run it, you're doing the wrong thing. This is from God's purview. And here's another one. It's called <coughs> extramarital sex. Extramarital sex. Oh, I know what that one is. Bible calls it adultery. It's always been adultery. It was under. It was adultery when God gave those ten commandments chiseled in stone. It said, "Thou shalt not commit adultery." That's what it was then. Still is today. You can give it another another name. It sounds better. But every time, and you know that. When's the last time you heard of our civil courts? 
prosecuting anybody for committing adultery. We don't do it. We don't do it because we run it. But it's still a sin in God's sight. Uh, there's so many things in our society today. Stealing's not really stealing. Uh, we've got different names for that. Shoplifting just isn't, well, it's not considered to be stealing. It is in the sight of God. Dope ain't really dope. Drunk is not really drunk. Gambling is not really gambling. Uh, we've got people in our government right here in the state of Kentucky says, buy a lottery ticket. Somebody's going to win, might as well be you. That ain't gambling. God says it is, and he runs it. This is my father's world. He made it, he owns it, and he runs it. But here's what we do as a society today. We pour perfume on it to make it smell better. And we set it to music to make it sound better. And we more pour a little sugar on it to make it taste better. Uh, and we put some flowers around it to make it look better. And we say, this is what we're going to do because I'm running it. It never has been that way with God. God loved us so much that he gave us his only begotten son. We've got a mindset in this United States of America, and it's a political agenda for a lot of people about the way that we're treating our planet. I want to tell you what God says about it. When he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he told them to dress it and keep it. He gave them a responsibility. We're not supposed to abuse it. Sometimes we do. But he did not put man in charge of this earth and say it's, it's all in your hands. It's all in your hands. I'm washing my hands of it. I've got other things to do. I've got Jupiter and I've got Saturn and I've got Mars uh, to see after and I'm juggling all these things. You take care of earth. And I'll do everything. It's not what God did. God didn't put us in charge of nothing. It's still His. He made it, He owns it, and He runs it. Now we need to do a little thinking about the coronavirus. I don't know how much of it is in the hands of men. But I can tell you this morning, God already knows about it. And if we didn't go to Him in prayer and tell Him, Hey God, we got a problem here on this earth. I don't know if you've heard about it, but we've got a disease that's killing some people. God already knew that. And the answer to it is not to shut church doors. I don't care who the governor is and the president or anybody else. The answer to it is not to shut church doors and tell people not to meet together and not to pray. And to leave God out of it, we're going to run it and we'll take care of it. If we do, I know what the ultimate result will be. It'll be disruption. Uh, and it'll be disaster and it'll be death if we take care of it. But we put it in the hands of God. God will do what's best for us. God always has done what's best for us. But sometimes man don't want to hear that and he don't want to see it. This is my Father's world. He made it. He owns it. And he runs it. And that's what we're here about today. If you're here this morning... Uh, and you think you can do it without God? You can't. It's not here for you to run. It's God's world and He'll run it. Are you here this morning? Is there something that we can do to help you? While we stand, Gabe and... While we stand. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing fire? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Trusting in His grace is high. Are you watching the blood of the Lamb? Are you watching the blood in the blood in the soul? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are you garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you watching the blood?